Adrian is Director of Research at Commonwealth, a UK-based progressive think tank that focuses on the political economy of ownership and aims at reimagining ownership in order to build, and I quote, an economy that's democratic and sustainable by design. According to its vision, the think tank focuses on key transformations towards a post-carbon, non-extractive uh, non economy that provides, thirdly, econ uh, economic security and dignity for all. Uh, there, Adrian co-authored many studies and reports with a focus on one of the key topics, that is asset manager capitalism, where corporate ownership is concentrated among, among only a handful of top shareholders, with BlackRock uh, arguably, arguably uh, best, the best known example, at least in Germany, um, shareholders whose investments uh, are distributed nearly universally across all regions, industry and asset classes. Before Adrian joined Commonwealth, she worked at another think tank uh, called Influence Map, where she also analyzed and mapped uh, uh, the impact of business and finance on the climate crisis. Um, all in all, uh, Adrian has made major contributions to our understanding of the role of asset managers, especially in privatized climate policies, and also uh, to our kind of capacities to imagine at least the contours of an alternative ownership regime. In terms of her academic background, Adrian holds a master's degree in global governance and ethics from Uni University College London. Her work is um, widely accessible, uh, being published regularly in The Guardian, The Financial Times, but it also appears in Jacobin, The New Statesman, uh, Dissent Magazine, uh, to name just a few. And she's also quite a regular guest on uh, at least uh, British TV and, and radio, maybe not so much in, in Germany. Um, uh, Recently. So, um, she's also author of two brilliant books, uh, uh, both published recently uh, last year. The first one is uh, this, uh, together with Matthew, uh, Matthew Lawrence, her colleague and director at Commonwealth. She co-authored this kind of uh, a book titled Owning the Future, Power and Property in an Age of Crisis, uh, published with Versal Books. And also, most famously, I guess, uh, the same year, 2022, she published this value of a whale uh, on, the illusion, uh, on the illusions of green capitalism with Manchester University Press, um, using the whale as an illustration, this whale, as an illustration of how the logic of green finance works that tries to encourage sustainable investments by big business. This book was selected on the Financial Times' best news book on climate and environment last year, and it's also named uh, one of Wired's best books. So um, in case you have not read it yet, you all know what's next on your reading list. Because I can assure you, they, don't, uh, they, they do look great, um, but they are also uh, as informative and a pleasure to read. So Adrian, we are looking very much forward to your talk on green capitalism, impossible yet inevitable. Thank you for coming. Thanks, everyone, and thank you, Philip, for a very generous, very detailed uh, introduction. I haven't thought about my master's degree in about seven years, so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so as Philip mentioned, uh, I will be speaking today, I guess, about kind of two seemingly contradictory questions or ideas that sort of motivate this talk, which is, is green capitalism possible? Is it an impossibility? And on the other hand, is it, at least from where we stand today, apparently inevitable or inescapable? So as Philip mentioned about two years ago, I wrote a book called uh, The Value of a Whale. I mean, it was published last year, but most of what I wrote was at least two years old. <laughs> Publishing works that way. Um, and in it, I tried to make sense of this kind of term that motivates this conference today, which is green capitalism, trying to understand what exactly is this new phenomenon? Is it all that new? Uh, is it a new kind of regime of accumulation? Or is it just the same capitalism as ever with a bit of a green veneer? Um, and I think in it specifically, I tried to look at kind of the sort of main policies that seem to define it, um, including things like the commodification of nature, which motivated the title of the book, The Value of a Whale, um, which was a brilliant study by the IMF that basically said that whales should be worth about $2 million each 
to the economy because of their services in carbon sequestration and also ecotourism. So uh, that was sort of a, a fundamental motivator for the book. Um, but two years on, um, what I wanted to do with this talk today uh, is sort of revisit the initial framework of green capitalism that I tried to set out um, and ask, has anything changed? Uh, is it, as I originally argued, still an impossibility? Uh, and critically, I think a really important motivating question for the left or progressives, however you want to call it. Today, what sense should we make of green capitalism? Is it uh, something that we need to engage productively with? Should we accept the kind of small crumbs of progress that these policies might deliver in terms of emissions reductions? Or should it be rejected outright in favor of you know, a more radical kind of solution? So I'll be focusing today on the Inflation Reduction Act um, from the Biden administration as sort of a prism through which to understand, I think, green capitalism more broadly. So apologies for focusing on the US as everyone always does, <laughs> but I think it has lessons that apply uh, to, to Europe and, and the world beyond. So I'll start with a, a quote from Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, which has already been mentioned today, which is that we focus on sustainability not because we're environmentalists, but because we are capitalists. <laughs> and this, I think, captures the kind of mindset of an increasingly vital faction of the global economy, and in my view, the kind of engine driving a lot of climate and ecological policy globally, um, which is green capital, and broadly concentrated in kind of the asset management industry. So why start with Fink? He captures the mainstream view here that broadly, you know, the profit motive, the underlying drive of capitalism can and must be harnessed in order to deliver the kind of decarbonization uh, and sustainable changes that we need to see. So the best way to kind of arrive at a sustainable economy in this view is to just kind of harness the animal spirits of financial markets and the profit motive to deliver the changes we need to see. Based on this kind of mindset, and I'm simplifying in the interest of time, you know, I argued broadly that green capitalism is in itself uh, a paradox. The faced with what is arguably the greatest threat to capitalism's own reproduction that it has ever faced, which is the climate and ecological crisis, its only response is sort of a desperate attempt to try to survive. And that means trying to find a way to sort of change the entire beating metabolic heart of capitalism, and that is the fossil fuel economy, uh, while maintaining and preserving all remaining structures that define capitalist economic and social relations. The institutions, the distributions of power and wealth, everything that goes along with capitalism must be maintained while overhauling the kind of central force that animates capitalism, fossil fuels. Uh, and a great kind of quote from a, an academic called Jack Copley, whose work I'll discuss later that sort of summarizes this, is that everything must change but our social rel relations. So this book was an effort to chart what this looks like, uh, what the policies are, and to argue ultimately that this uh, kind of anti-politics, as I consider green capitalism to be, is both dangerous and self-defeating. So very briefly, I'll run through, oops, uh, some of what, oh, okay, well, this is now blank, so you'll just have to imagine that there are words on it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> some of the kind of basic policies that I started out with, and in a very simplistic sense, you know, green capitalism, and this won't come as a surprise, uh, is just a means of rendering everything that we need to do from uh, halting biodiversity collapse to curbing emissions and everything in between to render all of these things market compliant. So finding market-based mechanisms to deliver these changes um, in order to kind of keep capitalism at the helm of this transition um, and sort of maintain those systems. So the kind of golden goose of this is obviously carbon pricing, carbon trading, carbon markets. That's kind of been the mainstream kind of idealized policy since the beginning of kind of engagement by William Nordhaus, for example, um, of the economics profession with uh, the climate crisis and environmentalism. Uh, the next, and this will be kind of the focus of today's talk, um, is kind of uh, asset manager capitalism as I think the kind of driving force of green capitalism insofar as it's, you know, as a counterpoint to fossil capital, probably the only kind of major industry in which there is sufficient power and wealth concentrated to drive for uh, a kind of different regime of capitalism. Uh, and this, in a policy sense, 
uh, materializes as kind of the, the mobilizing private finance phrase that we hear at every single kind of COP summit. Um, when I finally find out how to mobilize all that private finance, you guys are done for. Um, mobilizing private finance, uh, finding ways to de-risk investment, um, and ultimately seeding the kind of planning and coordination of this process to, to the markets. Uh, and then finally, I guess the issue that, uh, that motivated the book as well, the kind of engagement with biodiversity and ecology only through the kind of uh, commodification of elements of nature into sort of ecosystem services, into natural capital, finding ways to uh, render sort of nature uh, into market compliant units and, and kind of financial products. So that's where I found myself in the summer of 2021. Uh, safe to say a lot can happen uh, in a year, let alone two. Uh, you know, Russian invasion of Ukraine sent energy and food prices skyrocketing and drove a global inflationary crisis. Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act and people like Paul Krugman hailed it as kind of the salvation of humanity. Everyone, even the IMF, started thinking that industrial policy was really cool again. Uh, uh, BP and its shareholders had a huge party last year. Some weird stuff happened in Britain. Everyone started using the word polycrisis. And here we are. <laughs> so time to take stock. Um, in that intervening period in which we've seen from some of the world's foremost capitalist governments a return to what the IMF used to call the policy that not, must not be named, industrial strategy, and kind of a return to protectionism, anti-globalism, and state intervention. What, if anything, has changed? Um, does my initial kind of definition of green capitalism, is it now irrelevant? <laughs> Is green capitalism still impossible? Is that still what we are facing? And ultimately, if it is, and if it is impossible, or indeed if it's not, how should the left understand and engage with this policy turn? Is it inevitable, or can we find ways to pursue a much more, I would argue, radical, progressive, and necessary uh, approach to addressing climate and ecological crisis? Uh, so, uh, just brief caveat, um, as before, you know, as Andreas said this morning, it's difficult to make claims to <laughs> phenomena as they are rapidly unfolding, um, but nonetheless, with things moving so fast, I think, you know, the effort to understand where we are is, is worth it. Um, so these are the two questions that will kind of motivate the rest of what I speak about. And as I said, I'll use the IRA as a prism to kind of approach these questions, to understand where green capitalism stands, and also why it's not only undesirable, but, as I'll argue, impossible. And then at the end, I'll turn to the second question with the caveat that I'm not a sort of capital P politics person. I am, for my sins, kind of a technocratic policy nerd. And so ultimately, I'm actually quite interested in a discussion and the views of those in this room. And I'm sure there's quite a lot of difference in opinion. But I think that that is sort of the most urgent question for the left right now and, and one that I think we don't yet have a clear answer to. So on that note, very briefly, uh, a crash course on the Inflation Reduction Act for those who, who don't know much about it, which would be fair. Uh, so it is um, largely because of the kind of chess that is the legislative process in the United States. Uh, it is an incredibly kind of compromised uh, bill that is all carrot, no stick, which means all winners, no losers. It's tax credits and incentives all the way down, coupled with you know agreements on new leases for fossil fuels and no kind of regulation that would approach what a lot of the climate movement would have demanded, which is anything like keeping it in the ground. Uh, and hence you see that good old Darren Woods, our favorite friend, absolutely loved the Inflation Reduction Act and the possibilities that it opened up for ExxonMobil. Uh, and it has two main components, I guess, one of which is sort of new public lending facilities to uh, sort of incentivize, de-risk, spearhead private capital to invest in major industrial projects. Uh, and the other is what two sort of colleagues in the US call bottomless mimosas, <laughs> which is effectively uh, untapped tax credits for investments in things that the, deem, the bill deems uh, useful, so electric vehicles, but also all sorts of kind of small level consumer changes uh, to, uh, to the US economy. And finally, it's, it's worth noting as well that it's framed explicitly around protectionism, so make it in America, uh, a line that Ursula von der Leyen has recently kind of echoed it with make it in Europe. Uh, it's framed around uh, industrial expansion and revival, um, and also very explicitly geopolitical conflict um, with China, which is referenced in the bill, which is kind of phenomenal. Um, and before I get into why I think the IRA is green capitalism the same as ever, I will give it credit for two 
potentially interesting changes uh, and breaks with the preceding consensus that we can return to at the end. And the first is that it is slightly less anti-politics than everything that's come before it. So it is a substantial break with decades of fixation on carbon pricing, on the ability for just arriving at this perfect magical carbon price to sort of drive drastic changes in the economy. So it is a complete break with what came before it in that respect. It also has some recognition of the importance of the labor movement and the politics of labor uh, to the viability of a political program that can tackle the climate crisis in the US. I say some, it's quite minimal. There are few provisions around extra incentives for paying a fair wage. So it's hardly radical, <laughs> but it's there. And the last is a mechanism called direct pay which um, enables entities that don't pay tax, so municipalities or nonprofit actors, to access the equivalent of tax credits. This is the first time in American history that that has <laughs> been the case. Broadly, in the past, the only way to access uh, subsidy has been through tax equity, which is basically for corporate actors to pay less tax. And so this time around, uh, there is some scope for the mass scaling up of incentives for sort of municipal, community, public, and nonprofit entities to engage in this transition. Will it be transformational? Difficult to say, but it's in there and worth acknowledging. Okay, so that was a crash course on the Inflation Reduction Act. So is green capitalism possible? impossible <clears throat> and is the Inflation Reduction Act the same as ever. Uh, I'm starting again classic with Larry Fink. He's been mentioned many times today. He's a very important man. Um, the central thing to understand about the Inflation Reduction Act is that it is entirely in keeping with much of the previous common sense in that uh, it uses the kind of socialized risk-bearing capacity of the state to incentivize and de-risk private capital leaving private investors ultimately in the driving seat. So rather than sort of direct public investment, direct planning, democratic accountability, it entirely cedes this planning function to the market, saying you come to us, we'll incentivize you, we'll reimburse you, but you decide where and in what to invest. So in this sense, you know, I think of it in some ways as, as climate policy by BlackRock, and I'll get into why that is. Um, but I consider it that way both in terms of the bill's original drafting. Um, they had kind of significant influence and the role of the asset management industry and in the kind of asset economy is significant in how this bill was designed. And they'll all, they ultimately stand to kind of benefit the most from it. Um, so what do I mean by this? Let's discuss asset manager capitalism. So this is um, much credit to the work of Benjamin Brown, who's a German academic who I've had the pleasure of working with on this issue. Um, asset manager capitalism is kind of a new ownership regime and a new kind of logic of uh, capital allocation and sort of corporate governance in the economy um, with really significant implications for how policy is designed and, and the direction that capitalism is heading. So for those who don't know, asset managers do kind of exactly what their name suggests. They manage assets on behalf of those who have them, whether that's a pension fund, rich individuals, a university endowment, uh, and they invest them through financial markets uh, into a whole range of things. Um, and they have become in some ways the kind of like vanguard unit of green capital, um, in large part because in the past 15 or so years now, the industry has both exploded in size, um, sort of doubling since the 2008 financial crisis into a more than $100 trillion industry. Uh, and within that industry, there is kind of phenomenal concentration. So this chart here looks just at mutual funds, which is a type of investment vehicle, um, showing that the top 10 managers control about half of all assets uh, in that kind of $100 trillion pool. And it's actually even a more stark picture than that. You know, BlackRock alone controls about $10 trillion in assets. And when combined with its two closest competitors, Vanguard and State Street, they account for about $20 trillion in assets under management, um, or you know, nearly a fifth of the industry as a whole within the hands of just three firms. And it's important to understand as well why uh, those firms came to that position of sort of concentrated power. And in part, it relates to something that I'm showing here uh, in the second graph, uh, which is the explosion of what's called passive forms of investing. So when you think about sort of investors on Wall Street, you tend to think of the kind of Wolf of Wall Street type stock picking and trying to beat the market. Most of what happens today in asset management uh, is increasingly sort of passive, where rather than kind of picking specific stocks that you think might perform well or specific companies, 
you just kind of track the market as a whole, you try to replicate its returns, and there's very little kind of human input into investment decisions because the whole idea is that you just sort of accumulate with the aggregate flow of, of the market as a whole. So the result is that today you'd be hard pressed to find a company that BlackRock isn't a top investor in. They have an average of like 5% of shares in every company, but they're also a truly universal investor in that they are exposed to commodities, every industry, every geography, every asset class uh, around the world. And it's not just BlackRock. I, I hate to sound like conspiratorial against Larry Fink, although it's probably worthwhile. You know, they're representative of a much broader trend. There are a few kind of behemoth firms, both in kind of classic asset management and sort of the more private equity space, which we'll look at as well, um, where this kind of degree of concentration is sort of the same. And so the combination uh, of all these factors, their size, their universal exposure, the fact that they earn their money based on a percentage fee that they charge relative to the size of the assets they manage, this gives them essentially one motivation, which is to grow the overall size of the asset pool that they manage. Um, BlackRock doesn't really care about the performance of any one company. It also doesn't particularly care about dividends. What it cares about is growing the size of the asset pool that it manages and very little else. And so this chart is just kind of to show an example of that. This was a finding from a paper I did with uh, Dr. Benjamin Brown. Um, and we called it the indexation effect. And what it shows is these are sort of top pension funds. And if you look down, this is the FTSE 100, the biggest kind of UK companies. They're broadly just investing like the exact same amount in every single company because there's no interest in trying to pick winners or losers. This is truly a sort of floating every boat kind of indiscriminate aggregate asset inflation approach to investing. <clears throat> so. As a brief pause, <laughs> if you are universal as an investor, you are universally exposed, and that does make the climate crisis a genuine threat to your ability to be profitable, to sort of reproduce yourself. This is a phenomenon that has made, uh, at least in mainstream kind of climate circles, um, popular the idea that this can, this motivation can be harnessed again for good and that BlackRock could actually be the kind of climate salvation that we all need because it is universally exposed and therefore interested uh, in the progress of the climate crisis. Um, however, I mean, I would argue and will argue that the way that they, uh, that the asset management industry seeks to resolve that problem is not necessarily by actually caring about sort of mitigation or adaptation, but in finding ways to ensure that policy uh, suits their interests and assures kind of stability and safety for the industry. How do they do that? Well, all of these concentrated assets give this industry incredible power, not only directly economically in terms of allocating capital, but increasingly very direct political power. They're systemically important uh, and they know it. Uh, BlackRock in particular has long been a very effective lobbying machine. Uh, in the past, it's focused a lot on kind of permissive monetary policy, so BlackRock loved quantitative easing. Um, but it has increasingly looked to all the regulation on, on sustainable finance. In the EU, uh, there was, I think, an ombudsman complaint because BlackRock was involved in creating the sustainable finance regulation as part of the Green Deal, which obviously would regulate itself. Um, so they're very involved. Um, but in the US, uh, many BlackRock alumni are in incredibly prominent positions uh, in the White House. This is not by accident. Uh, it's been said that Larry Fink, the CEO, has spent a long time designing sort of a shadow cabinet uh, of, of BlackRock alumni in US government. Uh, but again, you know, they are the largest player. This is broadly a much wider issue than BlackRock. We have, I guess, a regime of capitalism that is based on uh, sort of asset price inflation, and that has been the case uh, broadly since the 1980s. And so anything that is good for BlackRock is deemed sort of necessary by capitalism to uh, the kind of stable functioning uh, of capitalism as a system. So as I said, lobbying for pr permissive policy is kind of the greatest way that BlackRock can reckon with the threat posed to its mode of existence by the climate crisis. And one of the key elements of that, and this speaks to the Inflation Reduction Act, is the need for new and attractive assets to invest in. Um, Larry Fink has often talked about the fact that the industry has far too much capital and not enough attractive places to put it. Uh, so enter 
you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, the European Green Deal, any kind of sort of public program that seeks to mobilize, de-risk, and incentivize private investment, create new investable opportunities for the private sector, rather than rely on sort of more direct public and democratically allocated investment. Uh, and this is just, I mean, we don't need to look at all of these graphs, there's probably too many. <laughs> um, but this is just to look at similar trends within the private markets. So looking at, uh, on the far right there, sort of infrastructure funds, um, and you can see overwhelmingly they're located in uh, North America and Europe. Um, and there's a high degree of concentration in the industry as well. So looking at the top kind of 25 managers uh, and the extent of the industry that they kind of command. And finally, uh, in the past couple of years, a sort of massive influx of money into a few kind of infrastructure mega funds, uh, which are seeking to sort of gobble up the incentives and investments of things like the Green Deal or the Inflation Reduction Act. So, um, <clears throat> summary of asset manager capitalism. Why does this matter? Why did I just talk to you about the dynamics of the asset management industry? Good question. Uh, this is a question, I think, of sort of understanding the interests, the governing logics um, of this industry and, and the policies themselves. So, so uh, the kind of flagship industrial policy, policy regime of the IRA has been hailed as, you know, the biggest climate bill we've ever seen um, by, by many in the kind of mainstream climate circles. But ultimately it is kind of uh, iconic green capitalism as it operates, again using uh, the de-risking power of the state uh, to incentivize private actors. Um, and overall, the kind of ultimate assumption of this program is that we can rely on the profit motive to deliver a sustainable economy, and the role of the state is simply to kind of lower the barriers to entry for private actors, uh, with the assumption as well that every element of a decarbonized economy is on some kind of inexorable path toward profitability. Um, that is a massive assumption that underlies the functioning of green capitalism, and it's one that I believe <laughs> is inherently incorrect. So, the trouble is, uh, from the perspective of uh, sort of climate and ecological crisis, particularly resolving these crises in a way that is not phenomenally unjust and doesn't cement global inequalities uh, to an inde indefensible degree, um, not everything that we need to deliver a kind of just and sustainable future is going to be profitable or profitable enough. Indeed, some of the things that we might consider most vital to a sustainable and, and just future, like care, um, which we'll hear about in a talk later, which I'm looking forward to, uh, should not and cannot be profitable in conventional senses. Uh, and, you know, Andreas Mel mentioned this earlier, fossil fuels have shown an incredible ability this year to kind of dwarf the profitability of, of renewable competitors. It's also a hell of a lot more profitable to have every American replace their car with an electric vehicle uh, than it is to invest in sort of decarbonized mass public transit. And so when you rely on the profit motive in a very brute sense, uh, what you'll end up with is a sort of set of decisions and actions that may not be compatible with a decarbonized future and certainly not one that is just. But uh, just setting aside the question of justice and inequality for a moment, although I think it's integral and we'll come back to it, um, even on its own terms, uh, the kind of assumption that the profit motive can be harnessed uh, has already been running into sort of massive interference. And this is from, on the left, a paper, again, by Jack Copley, who I, who I quoted earlier, um, called Decarbonizing the Downturn. Um, and the argument is that uh, he draws on the work of Robert Brenner, who kind of makes this very long durée analysis about the declining profitability of uh, sort of advanced economies, particularly related to the manufacturing sectors. And this is kind of a stagnation over several decades that seems irreversible with sort of small blips of kind of uh, subsidies and, and industrial policy kind of breaking the trend. Whether or not you accept the kind of Brenner thesis uh, about the kind of overall waning profitability of capitalism, certainly within the renewable industry itself, and I'm just using this as one example, uh, this is already beginning to bear fruit. Um, so after a sort of brief explosion of, of investment uh, in, in solar and offshore wind and comparable technologies, 
the kind of intense competition uh, and building of capacity in those sectors has had a massive impact on eroding the profitability uh, of these industries with the effect that although we constantly hear about the triumphalism of like expanding uh, solar and, and offshore wind investment and kind of we're on this incredible upward path um, most of which is driven by state policy in, in China um, the actual kind of overall composition of renewable energy uh, since 1990 has broadly stayed consistent in the overall energy mix, um, which I think is a kind of remarkable finding. Uh, this is a sort of uh, UNEP paper. Um, and you think that, you know, this is the industry of the future. Uh, everyone knows that this is where society needs to head. Surely the kind of rational animal spirits of capitalism will be looking to the future and investing in this industry. Uh, but unfortunately, when you hitch your wagon to the profit motive, um, the kind of erosion of profitability in these sectors has presented a substantial problem that is only going to sort of increase as an issue for waning private sector investment uh, in these industries. And this is something that things like the Inflation Reduction Act directly try to sort of counter by providing uh, public support for these industries. Um, but what we've entered is sort of an arms race of public subsidy for the private sector to socialize the risk and privatize the losses uh, in lieu of things like direct public investment. Uh, and sort of the result is that you get, I mean, these are just from the past couple weeks, um, sort of the failure of multiple sort of wind auctions, even with public subsidy. This is the US and, and the UK over the past several weeks. Um, because you know rising costs meant that for the private sector even with the subsidy regimes in place and the incentives uh, investing in offshore wind for example was simply not profitable enough according to their kind of subjective and relatively arbitrary hurdle rates which represent what they need to return to investors uh, and it meant that in the UK we now have a year in which we failed to build any new offshore wind and that is a year from which we you know we can't return we can't get that year back uh, and our reliance on public subsidy and the kind of whims of financial markets means that we'll build no new wind this year. The U.S. is facing similar problems. And this will be kind of an escalating uh, crisis, I believe, for, for the coming years. Okay, so that's taking it on its own terms. Can we hitch our wagon to the profit motive? I would argue the answer is already being given, uh, that there are serious risks uh, to doing so, particularly in in an increasingly uncertain and sort of chaotic uh, climate and, and geopolitical context. Investors want certainty, they won't invest without it, uh, and increasingly we can't give them that, even with kind of exhausting the engines of public subsidy. So now taking away from, you know, green capitalism's own terms, um, I think there are additional kind of more fundamental uh, challenges to green capitalism. Uh, which are sort of many and varied. <laughs> and these relate to uh, questions about sort of material throughput and about sort of uh, extractivism and global questions of justice, which I argue, you know, we should care about in their own right. Um, but even if you didn't care at all about global injustices, they are materially relevant to the question uh, of whether green capitalism is viable. So most of the kind of industrial protectionist policy that we're seeing explicitly deals uh, with uh, the climate crisis on a national level um, and looks at curbing emissions kind of in a national vacuum almost, ignoring in many respects the kind of intense and physically embodied nature of decarbonization, whether that's through lithium mining and its impact on communities and ecologies throughout the global south, uh, and whether that's just through sort of brute material throughput, which we've not yet been able to sort of decouple in any way uh, from, from economic growth, and a sort of system that is built around spurring to the maximum degree possible these sort of productive industries in a handful of sort of global north elite countries um, spells serious uh, questions of, of injustice um, and extractivism and sort of neo-colonial issues for, for much of the world. Um, as I said, I think it's vital for any of us to consider those impacts on their own right and be concerned with those outcomes for the very fact that we shouldn't subject much of the world to incredible extractive and, and harmful destruction to preserve the kind of structures of capitalism that exist within the global north. But in addition to that, this graph has come, uh, comes from a paper in, in Nature uh, called Scientists Warning on Affluence, um, which charts basically the direct relationship between the kind of indefensible degrees of global inequality, both within and between countries, 
and the extent to which that continues to drive escalating climate and ecological crisis. Um, and one of the, I guess, most interesting quotes is that all the kind of efficiency gains in production that tend to be kind of championed by private industry uh, have broadly been wiped out by sort of increased elite uh, consumption and sort of production for uh, a vanishingly small minority of, of the world's people. And so, as I said, whether or not you care about inequality on a moral level, I think you should. Uh, if you don't, nonetheless, in a very physical embodied sense, this is acutely relevant to the ability for uh, our economic system uh, to, to become sustainable and to stabilize itself. Um, and, you know, capitalism itself more broadly, I think we all know, is kind of an engine of accumulation. That is what it sets out to do. So by its very nature, it sort of mechanically produces and reproduces inequalities. Um, any kind of redistributive project on a grand scale or effort to kind of arrest runaway growth uh, in the service of a vanishingly small minority of the world's population is kind of antithetical to the smooth functioning of capitalism. Uh, and that is something with which we need to contend, um, particularly given, again on this chart, not only the kind of failure to decouple emissions uh, from growth in any kind of serious way, but particularly the kind of often forgotten material throughput and physical impact uh, in terms of extraction, in terms of deforestation, in terms of the communities associated with these processes uh, and sort of demand for resources around the world. As an aside, I just want to touch on, because this is sort of my area of passion, how the Biden administration is actually engaging with the question of, of nature and how to account for the degradation of nature in uh, sort of green growth and green capitalism. Uh, and it's actually planning to incorporate sort of natural capital into the national accounts, um, which some people view as quite revolutionary. Um, but what I want to show you here is how that they're planning to sort of arrive at uh, what nature is worth in its various constituent elements uh, to, to the economy. And this shows some of the ways that we arrive at values. So things like market price, you know, what would something fetch in a market, but also hedonic pricing, which is my personal favorite, which is that property values uh, near lakes and parks tend to exceed, you know, properties that are by, I don't know, a wetland. Uh, from an economic perspective, it makes sense for that kind of land cover to be more valuable. From an ecological perspective, that's obviously a nonsense. And so you end up with really fun results like this, which is if you look through the kinds of sort of proposed values for natural capital accounting in the United States government, things like wetland, uh, things like forest, coral reefs, shellfish reefs, incredibly low value compared to our all-time favorite beaches and dunes. Uh, and this is because, you know, coastal property in California is incredibly valuable, uh, and therefore it is worth more in our sort of natural capital accounts than any other forms. Um, so that's a bit of an aside, but just a, an insight into how sort of green capitalism is seeking to incorporate nature in some way into its sort of uh, attempt to make a sustainable economy that maintains uh, capitalism. Sorry, that's just another version of that. And you can see that beaches and dunes overwhelmingly uh, are valuable because of their aesthetic value. So that's great. Pollination? Nothing. <laughs> Who needs pollination when you can have aesthetic value? Am I right? <laughs> All right, so as it should be obvious, I have just argued for the past, I don't know, half an hour that I think green capitalism is both on its own terms impossible and incredibly undesirable uh, from the perspective of sort of global justice and a world that is not only habitable, but in which we can all sort of thrive and live, <laughs> uh, you know, not just survive, but thrive kind of, kind of question. So, as we near the end, uh, if, if green capitalism is itself a paradox, uh, you know, beholden to the fickle and destructive imperatives of financial markets, tethered inappropriately to the profit motive, uh, and sort of indifferent to the driving force of profound inequalities that underlie the ecological crisis uh, we're facing, how should we respond to it, given that everything up to this point was broadly denialism, overt obstruction, and an comparative dearth of action whatsoever uh, on climate and ecological crisis. Uh, this is an urgent question, uh, one made all the more so by the urgency of the kind of destruction and calamity we're already facing. We've all seen this graph now a thousand times. This is from the most recent kind of uh, IPCC update uh, in advance of, of COP. Uh, 
The question is so urgent because on the one hand, green capitalism is, in my view, an impossibility. On the other, it's currently all we have. Uh, and it's, as I said, sort of in some ways a progression on a world that we had before of overt denialism, obstruction, and total inaction. At the same time, even though ecological crisis represents you know, the greatest threat that capitalism has ever faced to its own reproduction, never have viable political coalitions or alternatives felt so out of reach. So to quote uh, from Thomas Meany in the New Left Review, the major strategic question we face runs along the axis of time. What concessions to capital are worth making and where, on the other hand, is implacable opposition in order? So maybe the most pressing question that we should ask of any kind of green policy is not necessarily how likely it is to enact a sort of radical transformation of our economic system itself, but how plausibly it might contribute to keeping portions of the planet sufficiently habitable for any kind of ecologically viable alternative post-capitalist system to have a chance uh, of taking shape. Uh, and so I still don't know where I stand on the answer, should the left, should progressives, try to engage with and project productively kind of harness uh, this kind of movement toward green capitalism in order to build something better, or given that in many ways it is bound to be a sort of self-defeating distraction um, from the much more radical work that needs to be done, is a wholesale rejection and much more sort of revolutionary approach necessary. Um, I'll turn that question to the floor, frankly, um, and I'm interested to hear everyone's thoughts. Um, just as two sort of provocations to get the discussion going. I tend to think in the kind of Rosa Luxemburg tradition um, of sort of revolution versus reform, um, which is that, you know, revolution should be the end goal. Uh, but reform is not necessarily always sort of a destructive distraction insofar as it can provide the grounds to build the coalition that can ultimately advocate for uh, a much more radical transformation. Uh, and there are certain elements uh, that are wins from you know, the labor movement, from the climate movement in these policies, like the direct pay provisions, um, that can sow the seeds of a much more kind of revolutionary politics. They can prefigure an alternative vision of how an economic system could work. Um, and perhaps that is a worthwhile uh, endeavor in and of itself. So to finalize, we're sort of in a, in a rock, between a rock and a hard place. The rock being, you know, the unbelievable speed with which we need to sort of radically transform our economic system. And the hard place being the kind of intransigent nature of capitalism and our sort of seeming lack of ability to change it whatsoever within anywhere near the kind of time frame that we face. Um, at the end of the day, I think, you know, these, it's a rock and a hard place. Only one of these things can change, and ultimately it is the politics and economic system. It's not to say that it will. That's the end. <laughs>